Chapter 13. Brian stood at the end of the long part of the L of the lake and watched the water, smelled the water, listened to the water, was the water. A fish moved and his eyes jerked sideways to see the ripples, but he did not move any other part of his body and did not raise the boat or reach into his belt pouch for a fish arrow. It was not the right kind of fish, not a food fish. The food fish stayed closed in, in the shallows, and did not roll that way, but made quicker movements. Food movements. The large fish rolled and stayed deep and could not be taken. But it didn't matter. This day, this morning, he was not looking for fish. Fish was the light meat, and he was sick of them. He was looking for one of the foolish birds. He called them fool birds. And there was a flock that lived near the end of the long part of the lake. But something he did not understand had stopped him, and he stood, breathing gently through his mouth to keep silent, letting his eyes and ears go out and do the work for him. It had happened before this way. Something had come into him from outside to warn him, and he had stopped. Once it had been the bear again. He had been taken the last of the raspberries, and something came inside and stopped him. And when he looked where his ears said to look, there was a female bear with cubs. Had he taken two more steps, he would have come between the mother and her cubs, and that was a bad place to be. As it was, the mother had stood and faced him and made a sound, a low sound in her throat, to threaten and warn him. He paid attention to the feel feeling now, and he stood and waited, patiently, knowing he was right and that something would come. Turn, smell, listen, feel, and then a sound, a small sound, and he looked up and away from the lake and saw the wolf. It was halfway up the hill from the lake, standing with its head and shoulders sticking out through a small opening, looking down on him with wide yellow eyes. He had never seen a wolf, and the size threw him. Not as big as a bear, but somehow seeming that large. The wolf claimed all that was below him as his own, took Brian as his own. Brian looked back and for a moment felt afraid, because the wolf was so, so right. He knew Brian, knew him and owned him, and chose not to do anything to him. But the fear moved then, moved away, and Brian knew the wolf for what it was. Another part of the woods, another part of all of it. Brian relaxed the tension on the, on the spear in his hand, settled the bow in his other hand from where it had started to come up. He knew the wolf now, as the wolf knew him, and he nodded to it, and nodded and smiled. The wolf watched him for another time, another part of his life. Then it turned and walked effortlessly up the hill, and as it came out of the brush, it was followed by three other wolves, all equally large and gray and beautiful, all looking down on him as they trotted past and away, and Brian nodded to each of them. He was not the same now. The Brian that stood and watched the wolves move away and nodded to them was completely changed. Time had come, time that he had measured but didn't care about. Time had come into his life and moved out and left him different. In measured time, 47 days had passed since the crash. 42 days, he thought, since he had died and been born as the new Brian. When the plane had come and gone, it had put him down, gutted him and dropped him and left him with nothing. The rest of that first day, he had gone down and down until dark. He had let the fire go out had forgotten to eat even an egg, had let his brain take him down to where he was done, where he wanted to be done and done, to where he wanted to die. He had settled into the gray funk deeper and still deeper until finally, in the dark, he had gone up on the ridge and taken the hatchet and tried to end it by cutting himself. Madness. A hissing madness that took his brain. There had been nothing for him then, and he tried to become nothing, but the cutting had been hard to do, impossible to do, and he had at last fallen to his side, wishing for death wishing for an end, and slept, only didn't sleep. With his eyes closed and his mind open, he lay on the rock through the night, lay and hated and wished for it to end, and thought the, world cl thought the word cloud down, cloud down through that awful night, over and over the word, wanting all his clouds to come down, but in the morning he was still there, still there on his side, and the sun came up, and when he opened his eyes, he saw the cuts on his arm, the dry blood turning black. He saw the blood and hated the blood. Hated what he had done to himself when he was the old Brian and was weak, and two things came into his mind, two true things. He was not the same. The plain passing changed him. The disappointment cut him down and made him new. He was not the same and would never be again like he had ever been. That was one of the true things, the new things. And the other one was that he would not die. He would not let death in again. He was new. Of course he had made a lot of mistakes. He smiled now, walking up the lake shore after the wolves were gone, thinking of the early mistakes, the mistakes that came before he realized that he had to find new ways to be what he had become. He had made new fire, which he now kept going using partially rotten wood 
because the punky wood would smolder for many hours and still come back with fire. But that had been the extent of doing things right for a while. His first bow was a, as a, a disaster that almost blinded him. He had sat a whole night and shaped the limbs carefully until the bow looked beautiful. Then he had spent two days making arrows. The shafts were willow, straight, and with the bark peeled, and he had fire hardened the points and split a couple of them to make forked points, as he had done with the spear. He had no feathers, so he just left them bare, figuring for fish they only had to travel a few inches. He had no string, and that threw him until he looked down at his tennis shoes. They had long laces, too long, and he found the one lace cut in half would take care of both shoes, and that left the other lace for a bowstring. All seemed to be going well until he tried a test shot. He put an arrow to the string, pulled it back to his cheek, pointed at the dirt hummock, and at the precise instant the bow wood exploded in his hand, sending splinters and sent chips of wood into his face. Two pieces actually stuck into his forehead, just above his eyes, and had only been slightly lowered. If they had only been slightly lower, they would have blinded him. Too stiff. Mistakes. In his mental journal, he listed them to tell his father, listed all the mistakes. He had made a new bow, with slender limbs and a more fluid, gentle pull, but could not hit the fish, though he sat in the water and was, in the end, surrounded by a virtuous cloud of small fish. It was infuriating. He would pull the bow back, set the arrow just above the water, and when the fish was no more than an inch away, release the arrow, only to miss. It seemed to him that the arrow had gone right through the fish again and again, but the fish didn't get hurt. Finally, after hours, he stuck the arrow down in the water, pulled the bow, and waited for a fish to come close. And while he was waiting, he noticed that the water seemed to make the bow, make the arrow bend or break in the middle. Of course, he had forgotten the water refracts, bends the light. He had learned that somewhere, in some class, maybe it was biology? He couldn't remember. But it did bend light, and that meant fish were not where they appeared to be. They were lower, just below, which meant he had to aim just under them. He would not forget his first hit. Not ever. A round-shaped fish with golden sides, sides as gold as the sun, stopped in front of the arrow and he aimed just beneath it, at the bottom edge of the fish, and released the arrow and there was a bright flurry, a splash of gold in the water. He grabbed the arrow and raised it up and the fish was on the end, wiggling against the blue sky. He held the fish against the sky until it stopped wiggling, held it and looked to the sky and felt his throat tighten, swell, and fill with pride at what he had done. He had done food. With his bow, with an arrow fashioned by his own hands, he had done food, had found a way to live. The bow had given him this way, and he exulted in it, in the bow, in the arrow, in the fish, in the hatchet, in the sky. He stood and walked from the water, still holding the fish and arrow and bow against the sky, seeing them as they fit his arms, as they were part of him. He had food. He cut a green willow fork and held the fish over the fire until the skin crackled and peeled away, and the meat inside was flaky and moist and tender. Then he picked off carefully with his fingers, tasting every piece, mashing them in his mouth with his tongue to get the juices out of them, hot steaming pieces of fish. He could not, he thought then, ever get enough. And all that first day, first new day, he spent going to the lake, shooting a fish, taking it back to the fire, cooking it and eating it, and then back to the lake, shooting a fish, cooking it and eating it, and on that way until it was dark. He had taken the scraps back to the water with the thought that they might work for bait, and the other fish came by the hundreds to clean them up. He could take his pick of them, like a store, he thought, just like a store. And he could not remember later how many he ate that day, but he thought it must have been over 20. It had been a feast day, his first feast day, and a celebration of being alive and the new way he had of getting food. By the end of that day, when it became dark and he lay next to the fire with his stomach full of fish and grease from the meat smeared around his mouth, he could feel new hope building in him. Not hope that he could be rescued, that was gone, but hope in his knowledge, hope in the fact that he could learn and survive and take care of himself. Tough hope, he thought that night. I am full of tough hope.